Hello and welcome to Rail Car Restores on the Road, episode two. Uh, we're at the North Norfolk Railway today, uh, Waybourne Works, where we've come to see the work that's being done by the Birmingham Rail Car Work Group, um, uh, which is led by Chris Moxon. Um, we are currently in front of DTCL 56182 trailer car, and we'll be looking at the power car 50479. Right, Chris. Um, where did uh, the rail cars come from and when uh, did they arrive at the North Norfolk Railway? So, the trailer car arrived first. There was a period of negotiation where I was actually bringing parts from the vehicle to the railway and restoring them in my spare time before the railway had agreed to actually take the vehicle. Oh. Um, but negotiations were successful and the vehicle came across in 2015, I think. It came from the Churnet Valley Railway, which is where it had spent the first part of its preservation career. It was originally rescued from Buxton Depot in Derbyshire, which was its last home on the main line. Um, as for the power car, 50479, that arrived more recently, um, a year or two ago, and that came from the Telford Steam Railway. Um, that had finished its days at Old Oak Common in London, running for Network South East, and has spent time at the Cambrian Railway, at Oswestry and Telford, before it then came to the North Norfolk Railway to make a pair with 56182. All right, okay, thanks, uh, thanks for that. Um, when did you commence work on 56182, and what have been your greatest challenges? The very first day I stepped into 56182 with my screwdriver and removed a piece of wood from around the window was in January 2014, wow. when it was still at the Churnet. So nearly 10 years of restoration. Um, and what 10 years it's been. <laughs> um, lots of challenges. I think one challenge that went surprisingly well and I really enjoyed learning a new skill was the complete rewire of the vehicle. Probably not the greatest challenge, but maybe the greatest challenge if you look at it in terms of satisfaction, you know, learning a new skill yeah. and it executed exactly. You've never done we wiring wanted. and that's right. So it's been a great learning. I'd always relied on other people yeah. for electrical voodoo. Yeah. I don't trust electrons. Yeah. So right doing the so. rewire yeah. was fresh territory and it, I really enjoyed yeah. the satisfaction at the end was perhaps the greatest because it was learning a new skill at the same time. Yeah. The greatest challenge in probably scale terms was the bodywork and just renewal of the cab front which is a serious weakness in the class 104 design. So when we were doing the bodywork we spent over a year just rebuilding the cab and it's practically new. It was completely destroyed. Super tin worm from the top down. Yeah. So in terms of the whole, everything had to come out. Yeah. Um, there was nothing left, just down to its frames, no floor, no yeah. front, no nothing. Yeah, I'm so, sure we'll dig out a, a before shot for uh, what Johnny will probably insert in this video. Yeah, that's uh, certainly a great, uh, journey and as we, we joined you on that for a little while before we uh, got the bug to buy our own uh, unit. Absolutely, early and, days. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, probably show some uh, little shots of the work that we did as well. I think All helps, it's in there now. Yeah, yeah, when we launch we'll probably be sitting in the toilet quite a lot because <laughs> we've done a lot of those parts. Yeah. Um, which era are you looking to restore uh, 56182 and 50479 back into? So 56182 is now very much on the home straight and it's our intention for this vehicle to launch and enter full passenger service later this year. Um, so our aim is this will carry a passenger before the end of the 2023 running season. Wow. As for 479, I can give a much less precise answer. Yeah. Another big project. Um, we will be looking between five and ten years, yeah. I would estimate. So, yeah, I totally understand that. That's uh, 2028, 
to the early 2030s should see the two car project fully fledged and complete, all being well. Yeah, I'll bring their kids along for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, right, thanks for that. Um, how many volunteers do you have working on uh, your projects? So, regular volunteers, there are five of us, I would say. It's a good number. And that is supported much to our we are great we're grateful to the North Norfolk Railway in that that core five are on occasions supported by various arms and other departments around the railway. Yeah. Um, such as Working together, that's good. Yeah, it makes sense. Upholstery being yeah. such an example. Railway volunteers who are um, here doing the coach upholstery yeah. have per had periods where they had no work for the railway's coaching stock fleet and we were very lucky that they were willing to do our seats during those gaps. Oh, right, right. So there's been occasional support from a wider oh, pool good. than that group of five. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, very good. Well, Teamwork makes the dream work. Oh, doesn't it, Just? Yeah, very good uh, saying. But uh, yeah, if anybody would like to get involved uh, in this project, obviously we are in North Norfolk currently um, at Weybourne, um, then get in touch with us and we'll put you in touch with Chris. Um, basically, now, can you show us around your units, please? Absolutely. Thank you very much. So, Chris, what uh, hurdles have you faced? on the bodywork side of things with the cab so far? So, just like your 117, this cab has a fibreglass roof down, which bolts onto the top of the steel and covers the cab front and the first doorway. This fibreglass down is a big weakness. The seal between the steel and the fibreglass fails and water gets in from the top and slowly works its way all the way down to the bottom and essentially rots off the entire cab. So class 104s are known for very severe cab front corrosion and round the front two doorways. So the biggest challenge at this end was the complete renewal of the cab and the front two doorways. So significant amounts of the framework and everything from the waist height upwards is brand new framework. And the skin that you see today is 100% new. Nothing was salvageable because of that. Far worse than the rest of the vehicle. It's the lasting for many years to come. Hopefully. All being well. um, another large challenge at this front end was the fitting of the working two character route indicator box, an original feature which was removed by British Rail in the 1970s. Um, our project aims to be as historically authentic as possible. So as part of that, having a working as-built route indicator to match the 1960s green livery was a desirable feature for us to do. Um, it was created using donor equipment from a Mark I Southern Region Electric unit. And being 100% honest, we completely underestimated just how much work that was going to take. So that was a massive project to get that seemingly minor feature reinstalled. I'm pleased to say it's now in and working, as, it, as I can demonstrate with it being halfway between the f number four and five. <laughs> so moving on to the side, what sort of challenges have you faced with renewing the bodywork and getting it to how she looks today? So some subtle differences on the sides between various other DMU designs. Um, making some comparisons with your project, the gutter arrangement on a class 104 and that upper cant rail level is actually comparatively good. Doesn't suffer from the same top end rot that suburban DMUs. So as far as the top end was concerned, a good rub down, a good clean down, strip all the old paint off and, and redo it basically. Clean the gutter, reseal was all that was required. The gutter didn't even need removing. Moving downwards, that's where the good news ends, I'm afraid. <laughs> Moving downwards, we have the actual main windows themselves. And again, unfortunately, one of the poorest earlier designs in the DMU world, which is glass 
screwed directly onto the body side steel using wooden bars. They were held in originally with a form of putty. This fails over the years um, and lets water in. And that creates severe body corrosion to the skin and framework from about, the, from about the waist height downwards. It gets in through that main body side glass and ruins everything underneath. So as with all class 104s, a lot of body work in the lower 50% was required. Select framework repairs and large areas of skin being chopped out and patched. Um, as 104s go, this one hadn't succumbed quite as badly as some of the others. So the method of totally reskinning the lower half was not, not, so not required. required on this, but a lot of, it's probably the last 104 in preservation that will be patched. There was a lot of areas let in. Most 104s restorations from now on will be lower half reskins given that degradation over the years. So we did that process and repeated it all the way around. So um, obviously we're at the back end now. Uh, would you like to tell us about some of the challenges you faced, Chris, and uh, the, the noticeable changes from its previous life? So the back end was, generally speaking, in better, much better condition than the cab end because it didn't have the fiberglass dome. So there was some corrosion around the bottom end with structural pillars and skin work. So the bottom end was renewed. Other than that, the rest of the bodywork on the end was fairly straightforward. The main challenge for the end of the vehicle was reinstatement of the connecting corridor gangway connection. Um, this had been completely lost in its days as a departmental Sunday or railhead treatment train in the 1980s and early 1990s. So we had to refit, remove all the old plate work that had been riveted over the top and refit a salvaged gangway, which actually came from a scrapped network rail, X network rail test unit which was a class 101. So lots of, and of course, along the way, everything was completely stripped down, renewed where required. You find a lot of wear in the scissor mechanism that allows them to go in and out, and that causes them to drop, which can cause problems when it couples up to a neighboring vehicle. So all of this was rebushed using machine bushes, repainted, reassembled, full job really. Excellent. Um, another noticeable feature that, as mentioned earlier, what we did before we bought a DMU help um, on this project is these footsteps. We actually took them home and stripped them, cleaned them, or handed them back to Chris. Just another little noticeable feature. Um, but now we'll head out over to the next bogey and then we can talk about the bogey overhauls. Right, so now we're at the bogeys. Do you want to talk us through the extensive bogey overhaul that the unit's undergone and uh, the tyre turning, etc.? So, during the restoration, some shed space unexpectedly became available and that allowed us to lift the vehicle and put it on stands. This in turn allowed us to have a good look at the bogeys and we found to our surprise that although the bogeys were seized up and covered in sandite paste from its departmental days. Everything was very stuck, but surprisingly not worn. We think it had had an overhaul towards the end of its passenger days and hadn't seen a lot of miles on its railhead treatment duties. So the bogey from a metalwork point of view, from a mechanical point of view, sorry, bushes and pins, etc., was actually in pretty good condition. But what it did need is completely dismantling every nut and bolt and link, spreading out over the workshop floor, stripping back to bare metal, repainting, regreasing and reassembling, which in itself took a few months. The wheels themselves, we felt, were never going to have the bogies down this far apart again. So the wheel profile, which was not brilliant, we thought we'd take the opportunity to turn them, which again was done in-house on the North Norfolk Railway's wheel lathe. So each of those wheels, one at a time, was turned to the correct profile before the reassembly. So a full bogey overhaul 
in effect, but with surprisingly little machining required. And now moving on to the interior. So, now we're on the interior, would you like to run us through all the cabinets, various fittings and uh, the changes? So, when this was converted to departmental service, it was one of the types that was to be pulled around by a diesel locomotive and it was essentially turned into a propelling position. So the cab windows, the driver's seat, the emergency brake valve, the ability to drop the brake if needed was pretty much all that was, and, and, and the front lights was pretty much all that was needed. Everything else associated with its use as a DMU, gauges, controls, panels, brake, driver's brake valve, was not needed and stripped out so it came to us in an in incredibly incomplete state very little left of the actual controls so aside from the basic restoration of the wall panelling and the floor the fabric of the whole cab many parts had to be drawn from scrapped vehicles in order to reinstate it as a proper driving DMU again um, as mentioned earlier, total rewire, so that included cab rewire, so lots of wiring looms hidden away under this desk. Um, all of this was rewired on all the new components wired in. Because of the corrosion and the water ingress, the cab top of the cab desk was completely shot. So a brand new four mica desk, um, which has still got its protected layer on, but it'll look nicer once it's unpeeled and revealed um, yeah and aside from so apart from that everything was everything was removed everything had to come out as part of that bodywork rebuild and so while it was out all of this panel work which on a class 104 there's a lot of fiberglass lots of fiberglass on the inside of the cab as well as the outside so all these panels all the cab window surrounds all fiberglass so again a new skill for me learning fiberglassing to get these repaired where they'd snapped off and looking as good as they could be. Excellent, certainly looks a treat compared to when you started. Thank you very much. So, now we're uh, in the main passenger saloon. Would you like to talk us through the first class section that we're currently standing in? So when we first restored the vehicle, we have a restoration tent which only covers approximately a third of the vehicle. So the initial strategy was to chop it up into bits and do one third of the vehicle or one passenger saloon at a time and that included outside work and inside work the build up the interior as well so the first class along with the cab was part of the initial earlier thrust of the restoration um, nice little area to do away from the second class because it's it's its own area being first class and there's there's those differences to consider um, one of the most attractive features in here is the wood veneer. Um, first class veneer, different to the second class, and this is laid onto the main partitions or bulkheads, along with thinner panels that furnish the walls. The challenge was to match original 1950s restored material with new reproduced material. What had happened was the water ingress had destroyed all of the side panelling none of it was on this none of this of it on the vehicle was reusable but the main bulkheads had survived albeit requiring splicing and repair so um figured macaw veneer i'm not sure that's the correct pronunciation but that's what's in this saloon for first class and i like to think we've got a decent match between old and new so the old stuff Rather than simply ordering it, the old stuff had to be carefully stripped down, bleached, repaired and spliced where it had rotted. Um, and then many, many days varnishing, re-varnishing, rubbing down, polishing, flatting back, varnishing again, varnishing and when you're bored some more varnishing. So we're quite pleased with the end result. The window surrounds themselves are original, mahogany. They survived. So... Again, strip back. 104s are quite unusual in the vast majority of DMUs were built with Formica 
bulkheads and formica panelling. Um, 104s were criticised when they were first built for being made of wood and old fashioned, essentially. But 50 years, 50, 60 years later in preservation, that original disadvantage has come full circle and is now regarded as a gem and a real advantage because members of the public really do respond to the attractive wood veneer and patterns which we've managed to recreate in here. So moving on to the middle saloon in the second class, uh, Chris is going to talk us through some of the different features in here. Uh, over to you. So this is the biggest saloon, the main central second class saloon. Um, as you can see, there's a change in veneer. Um, in second class, they used laced wood veneer, which luckily is still available. Um, so same again, bulkheads are original and side panelling is new, window surround still original. Um, it was a lot lighter, um, which gives a nice contrast between the darker window surround. And whilst we're at this window, we can show one of our latest creations, which is a reproduction blind. Again, in the 1970s, we think all the blinds were removed by British Rail, deemed unnecessary. But we'd like to reintroduce them because fading of the fabric or maquette on the seating is a problem for us. The sun and the UV is very strong in North Norfolk, very strong on the eastern side of the country. So we have a lot of problem here with seats fading, perhaps faster than some other railways maybe that are located sort of inside valleys maybe. So as part of that fight and protecting our investment in the new seating, we thought putting the blinds back would be useful for when the vehicle's not in traffic for a period of time, we can pull the blinds down and kill off that UV. So again, brand new, sewn up, and this one test fitted, we're happy with it. So we're gonna apply those to the rest of the windows. Also in here, we can probably show the newly fitted lino flooring. Again, due to water ingress below the windows, the original lino was um, just too old and brittle and broken to clean up or restore or retain. So it was all chipped up. And um, one of the few places where we treated ourselves to a contractor, he came in and did a very good job laying this new um, marmoleum lino flooring. So now we're at the uh, the back end of the vehicle. Here we have toilet compartment. I'll let Chris talk you through it. So the toilet compartment itself survived intact in terms of the walls. However, the inside again was completely stripped out. So we set about finding porcelain and various fittings from scrap vehicle, some DMU, some not DMU. We're fortunate in that most British Rail vehicles built at roughly the same time share various toilet fittings. So there are parts of that toilet salvaged from electric units and Mark I coaching stock. Railways who don't want to keep their toilets in operation, we were able to obtain parts. And it's actually, as we stand at the moment, it's actually the only part of the interior that is completely finished and ready to take passengers so that's an area where we've now finished close the door and it'll just get a clean before it goes into service so excellent we were talking about the differences with the corridor and the, the departmental and what's changed back there so in departmental days they didn't keep the locomotive always on the back end they wanted this to essentially be almost like a single unit bubble car, but without engines. So they wanted to be able to push and pull it from either end and in either direction. So when they plated over the corridor connection, they put a window in the door. They bolted a guard seat in the front here and brought pipe work up from the brakes to allow an emergency valve and brought electrics into the corner for front lights. So there was quite a bit of messing around at this end. Um, this panel here was completely cut away. There was a big desk unit fitted here, all the modifications located within the desk. And there was a gauge 
to show what the brake was doing, similar things like that. So again, um, as part of the restoration mission statement was to rid the vehicle of every last sc scrap of departmental modification. And when it goes back into service, we hope that enthusiasts can come along and try as hard as they like to detect any hangovers from its departmental gaze and they'll, they will fail in that endeavour, I can assure you. <laughs> so this is DMBS 50479, ultimately their worst unit, but it's got some interesting prospects. So let's take a look around her and uh, let's rip into uh, Chris a little bit on uh, his worst work, but it will, as you can see, go to that utterly amazing DME, uh, which is actually the most exciting part about this unit is where it's going to go. All right then, Chris, so we're at the rear of 5479. Um, would you like to tell us what's been started and the, the weaknesses and just where this project's heading in terms of this side of it? So as we've got closer to the end of the restoration on the trailer car, there's been certain times when particular skills are required to finish jobs off and people have been available, other people have been available to do work. So we've actually been in a privileged position to be able to work on two at once and kickstart the restoration of this one. So we've had people making a modest start on just starting to dismantle um, various components to make a start on the primarily the bodywork uh, at the back end. Because the cab of the other one was such an ordeal, we felt we weren't ready yet to take on another cab the wounds hadn't healed sufficiently yeah. so we thought why not do this one more from the back and work towards the front rather than the front and work towards the back um, it also has the guards compartment at the back which we've not restored a guards compartment before so to keep things fresh we thought what better place to start um, so what the guys have been initially doing is making a start on stripping the many layers of both preservation and BR era paintwork um, as you can see, when you get to a 104, at the start of the process, very different to how it looks towards the end. This section, the entire side, has completely come away at the bottom, making reference again to that lower half water ingress. Also on this one, over the doorway, the gutter has failed. A fairly rare case of upper end corrosion. Water has got in and just sort of dribbled down and made a complete mess of this bodywork panel which is in a terrible state and will need completely replacing. Our plan on this vehicle is to completely reskin from here downwards because there's just too many holes under the windows and along the bottom and the framework is too far gone. It'll be a patchwork nightmare to put it lightly. Too many patches, not worth patching this one so Complete renewal of the lower half is what's in store in the coming years. So, moving into the unit, do you want to talk us through some of the usual corrosion bits that you say you sorted on 56182 and what's gone on here in 50479? So, this is a, an exercise of the unhealthy anatomy of a class 104 and how the structure is. So, joining bottom of the roof to the top of the floor are a series of top hat sections which run alongside the doors and the windows. Box sort of structure. Between them are strengthening ribs and then at waist height a slightly beefier Z section which runs all the way around essentially the window sill and then there's sort of vertical pillars again below. Um, as you can see here very bad corrosion from the windows downwards. Um, this section of Z section has not actually been removed. It's just, it just, when, when the panelling came off, it just came with it in a, a pile of Weetabix basically. Um, and, and you can see the rest of it is just so hold that this will all, this will all just have to be chopped off and gone. Brand new framework, brand new skin to kind of put that right. Um, most of the rest of the panel work hasn't been removed yet because it's early days, but we're expecting, this is one of the worst corners of the vehicle, but 
we're expecting similar scenes around the rest of the vehicle. Um, so yeah, a lot of work to do. Um, lots of renewal ahead. Right, now, moving on to the main saloon. Would you like to talk us through some of the areas of, of ro rust and corrosion that have <laughs> gone on in here? So this is a direct, essentially a direct copy. So the, this main central second class saloon is identical to that found in 56182. Uh, the main difference, of course, being its condition. So this is not a million miles away from where we started with um, 56182. Um, showing some of the degradation that you see in these, the sort of the wooden panelling doesn't survive like Formica does. So you can just literally, you can just put your fingers through this panelling, hence the comment about none of the side panelling is, is salvageable. Um, even worse below the windows usually. Um, again, lino, lino, you can just pull up and break in your fingers. So not salvageable at all. Um, roof vents have leaked over the years and caused the ceiling panels to get damp and collapse. So we usually find the framework of the ceilings survives. So they'll be taken down completely stripped of their wooden skins, framing restored where necessary and spliced and then refitted. Um, but yeah, this is a very typical, this is a very typical passenger saloon. And unlike 56182, this didn't have a departmental life. This came straight out of passenger service into preservation. So although it's stripped out now, as far as seating is concerned, that is something we've, that's something we've done. Um, as one of the first parts of the restoration. So this came to us with um, all its seats, seat frames, which um, the trailer car never had. Um, and you know, all the fittings, luggage tracks, so everything is... Um, all the puzzle pieces are there. Yeah, everything needs work, but crucially, it needs work, but it's here, it's complete, which makes this vehicle a very different project from a restoration point of view less finding of parts more straightforward and yeah you know, and less making parts from other vehicles fit it's more remove mark up where it's come from restore or replace if necessary and put back um, so quite a different proposition in here right so moving on to the cab a very different scene to what is in 56182 currently i'll let you explain chris so aside from the presence of the controls this is a not far from identical picture to how 56182 was 10 years ago so those leaks with the fiberglass dome that I talked about earlier have had their wicked way in here and um, because the water's been getting in at the top of the vehicle rather than at the bottom of the windows you've got problems from head height downwards basically so you know metal work has just it's just in pieces there's nothing left there's nothing left of the main structure that runs pretty much all the way around at gutter level um, it may be there in spirit but it's certainly not there in reality anymore um, so again moving downwards wood any wood has just rotted. Um, thank goodness for BRCW, the builder's decision to introduce fiberglass into the cabs because as a sort of form of, as a sort of relation to plastic, essentially early form, that is the one feature that can sit in water for years and years and years and substantially it's the panels that are fiberglass are still so with us. So similar to 56182, the wooden cab desk is completely dropped in that corner. Um, the floor in that corner has completely rotted away and dropped away. Um, and it just doesn't meet the standard that we want, even the fittings that are present. And what I mean by that is towards the end of their lives, on the British Rail Network, they just the mission was to just keep them going. As stuff failed, depots did what was required 
to swap or keep things going. The finesse and the cosmetics side of things was not the primary focus. One example being the nice fiberglass pod that the air and vacuum gauges sit in on this vehicle has just been replaced by uh, some 3 mil plywood that's been nailed together into a little box. Um, luckily we have a spare of those so it's just features like that that is it functional sure is it right and what it was built with and attractive in its appearance absolutely not so as part of that full restoration these are some of the things is why it takes so long um, so all this will be stripped out and redone to the same standard restored to the same standard and uh, yeah slowly refitted probably rewired as well while we're at it <laughs> Awesome. Certainly going to be a two car set to be proud of. Um, well, I hope you enjoyed today's uh, episode of Rail Car Restorers on the Move. Um, it's uh, been a very enlightening uh, episode, and uh, thanks very much for uh, having us here today, Chris. Thank you, always welcome.